large part of our business careers. Uh, so we, we all we all want to make a living, but we all want to preserve pinball. We all the world would exist without pinball. I mean, let's face it, the world would go on. A little bit of the fabric of life would be gone. And all of us, most of us working with me, we've done this all in our, our entire business careers. I say that I've been doing this for 64 years because I'm 66 years old. And we started, the family started making pinball machines. Uh, at, well, back up. My father started as a game operator in Philadelphia. And uh, then as many operators in those days, that was in the 30s, he became a game distributor in order to get games earlier, cheaper, get them before his competitors. So then he was a game distributor. In 1947, as a 35-year-old punk kid, and I can say 35-year-old punk kid, but I'm 66, as a 35-year-old punk kid, he came to Chicago to visit uh, some of the suppliers, and he's kidding around with Harry Williams, who was probably a 39-year-old punk kid at the time. Uh, he sat behind his desk, Harry's desk, put his feet up, kidding around, and said, Harry, why don't you sell me the company? And Harry said, well, I have to think about that. I'll go up in my airplane. He flew around Chicago for three hours, he had a bonanza with the plane with detail. For three hours, came down, sold my father half the company, and we moved from Philadelphia to Chicago uh, when I was three. He commuted you know, for a year. So I say I've been in this uh, for 64 years. Actually, maybe before that, in the sense that you know uh, we, were, we were game distributors and operators in the family. I was born in 45, so in 47, he, he bought into Williams, and, and uh, ultimately, Harry uh, sold out, but Harry was always involved with us, whether we were at Williams, whether when my father went one year to the executive vice president of Valley in charge of their pinball, came back to Williams, uh, Harry had gone with him there. Uh, when we had Stern, Harry went with us to Stern, and, uh, and Harry was like a second, you know, second father. He was, you know, was always there and as part of it. And, and in fact, you mentioned Stingray, which uh, you know that was the Stern Electronics days, and my father had retired. Uh, and and uh, my sister-in-law said to me, hey, we, we, we had left Williams, we had both left Williams in 1976, early 76, and I was in bankruptcy in uh, And my sister-in-law said to me, you got to get Sam, you got to get him a job. He's cleaned my closets twice this week. He had nothing to do. So we bought the uh, assets out of a bank foreclosure of Chicago Coin, and we had the first start. And Sam worked camp days, but he was the guiding force behind us, and of course the name company was, was named Stern because of Sam, not, not because of me. Our second game, and I learned something from Harry. One time I, I brought Harry to uh, to the house, uh, I picked him up at the airport, took him to, to my father's house, and the three of us are laying out, uh, lay, laying on the floor, uh, looking at a, a, a plate fill drawing. And in those days, everything was done, I'm just just scrambling on here, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to something that's happened in some of an order. In those days, everything was done on a, a drafting table, a drawing board, which you don't find anymore. Today, you, yeah, everything is done. It used to be done in CAD, computer assisted design, which is two dimensional. We do everything in SolidWorks now. SolidWorks is three dimensional. Uh, maybe I'll get a chance to show you some film that has some of it on it. But if you don't have SolidWorks, you know, you're, you're not in the modern world. And we need to bring pinball into the 21st century. Again, the theme that I'll come back to. Um, the, uh, um, uh, anyway, so Harry, you know, uh, uh, Harry, Sam, and I are laying on the floor there, and he had this play field drawing, and again, everything was done with drafting, with a pencil on it. And we were modern, we had electric erasers. That was, you know, that was the modern, you know, amount of, you're, you're, you're nodding back there, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know that you got to have solid work to do anything today, and any, because, again, digress. In solid works, you model the whole, the whole uh, uh, part. And, and you see how everything interferes. Will the ball even fit through? Will these switches, will the screw go through the middle of the play field? You see everything that's going on. And then you don't print out a blueprint. You give the model on the disc or on your FTP site to the, the metal house or the, or the wood house or whatever. And they put it in their CNC machines and boom, out comes the part. They don't have to convert the drawing into a, a tool or into a CNC tape or, or anything else because it's all, it, it's just, there's no chance of error. The drawing is the drawing. The model is the model. Anyway, so Sam and Harry and I are laying on the floor. And, uh, and uh, uh, Sam says, this is great, this and that, except for this 
upper left corner here, you know, and I, you know, you should change this to this and that. So that's 10 o'clock at night. I take Harry back to his hotel where I know he doesn't have a draft table. I pick him up in the morning, and here he is. He's got the drawing showing Sam with exactly what Sam thought the upper left corner should be. He obviously came, came to Chicago with two drawings, one the way he knew Sam would like, and the other way he knew the, that Sam would like. So from that I learned that when we were making Stingray, I think the Stingray was the second game, uh, and we had, there were no heat problems in those days, there were ROMs, mass ROMs, um, and, um, uh, which meant you had to order these months and months in advance. Well, okay, we're gonna switch games, we gotta switch program. We don't have time to get mass ROMs. You know, there the, were no e ROMs, you, know, you couldn't get mass ROMs. So I figured out, okay, if this switch was a thousand points and this switch was light A, I'll stack the two switches and I'll get a thousand points light, light A from this rollover. Okay. Now I know Sam's gonna say, we can't do that, it's just not gonna work. So what do I do? I put a flipper, for the guys and I, we put a flipper right in the middle of the play field, right in the center of the play field. And he looks at it and says, he had told me before you can't do that switches on the stack like that. He looks at me and says, you can't put a flipper in the middle of the play field just out there like a sheet in the wind. So we were able to stack the switches and do what we wanted to do because Harry taught me that that's how you handle my father. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to digress today a lot. I got, I got a whole speech that I do all the time, but I'm going to digress a lot. I was talking about Harry in the airplane, and um, he was a pilot. Actually, he had the first private jet it was made in France. He imported it here. He was going to market it. He was going to sell them. He was really into his airplanes. Um, and did not like helicopters, they, you know, because they don't glide. You know, the, the, the motor stopped it. You know. So the the head electronic engineer, uh, the mechanical engineer, was a guy named Gordon Horlick. It was Harry Gordon Horlick. My father was in sales and what have you. You know, he owned a part of the company, sales and what have you. Gordon was a pilot, he trained bomber pilots in World War II. And then this was 47, 48, 49, but you know, he was obviously a really good pilot. You know, he was a trainer. He, he trained these guys. So Harry bought a Link trainer. A Link trainer is a little box you sit in, and in the dark, with instruments, you, you're simulate, it's a, simulating flying an airplane. <coughs> Every afternoon, Harry and Gordon spent the afternoon flying the Link trainer in the engineering department. My father flew it once, made a perfect landing, perfect landing, except it was 300 feet underground. Other than that. <laughs> anyway, we've got to talk a little bit about what I, I wanted to start talking about here, and that, that is a little bit about we do, what we do, and what, what we're going to do. Um, as I said, uh, I was two when my father uh, went into manufacturing pinball. Prior to that, he operated games of all sorts. He used to take my mother out on a date and stop at a, at a spot, you know, at a bar, and collect the jukebox so he had money for, for, for the date. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, 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 we, we go way back in this. I was around it and listened to him and his customers and his, uh, you know, uh, people working with. I used to go to the to the office on the weekends and, you know, I, I, we, I, I, I and you guys probably remember the baseball games with the man running unit in the back and the little cardboard in those days. I had all those in my desk and when I was supposed to be doing homework, I would play baseball with my own little baseball team down in, the, in my little desk drawer and I had pop bumpers there and, 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 and plastic, you know, all the little plastic posters. You know, it's all made in Chicago because we're in Chicago, like Detroit was the center of cars. We're in Chicago and the people who work in this business and have the tooling for the plastic posts and, and everything there in Chicago. We, uh, anyway, we used to play with them all instead of homework and we arranged everything. When Atari made pinball machines, and uh, they made one very good pinball machine called Superman that, uh, that um, uh, uh, Steve Ritchie, uh, who I'm thrilled to say is back working with us, uh, and moved to Chicago. And he, he, and I, I wanted to do this enough to move from California to Chicago, uh, which Harry did, he said, in California. Uh, but in uh, any event, uh, when Atari made pinball in California, uh, just everything was from Chicago. They used to buy the legs, which weighed about three pounds a piece, and ship them from Chicago to California. The play fields they tried to make in California, they made in Chicago. Everything was in Chicago, the factories were in Chicago, and the result was that they couldn't make any money with it. The other problem they had is that, is that if you're in California, the West Coast, 
you know, building games. You see a lot of the, the video game companies that are, the Japanese companies are centered in, 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 have offices in California because the bosses all want to play golf and it's a longer cost. And it's much cheaper to play golf in California than it is in, uh, in Japan. So they put their offices and sales offices in Cal California, but most of the manufacturing is done by subcontractors. In Chicago, we are a shipping point. We're in the center of the country. We have good export shipping through Montreal, New York, but better through Montreal. We, you know, we can ship all over the country. We're not shipping from California to Florida. It's just, it's just a better place like for manufacturing of that type of thing, which is why, why it's there. You know, we see today there's some talk. A lot of things are made in China, but there's going to be manufacturing coming back to this country. It, it, some will go to Vietnam because China's trying to raise their, their wages, double their wages. Some will go to, to uh, Mexico, but a lot will come back to this country. Part of the problem is even though it's, it may still be cheaper to manufacture there, the freight of shipping products back here is very expensive. To ship a whole pinball machine, a box of air, you know, becomes, it becomes uh, expensive. It's going to add mm, 75, 80 bucks right there to the cost of the game to get it to Chicago or California to then ship it out. Anyway, so back to me working in pinball. I have that wrestling like crazy. I'm not even through the first quarter page. Um, you guys are going to sit or stand. I appreciate that for a long time. We're a manufacturer. I started in the stock room when I was 16. I used to work there in the summers. Uh, and as much as we love pinball design, we are manufacturers. First and foremost, we're manufacturers. So this is not an easy product to make. The pinball machine, the way we make it now, as we did in the, in the last uh, century, and we have to bring ourselves to the 21st century, come back to that. Um, this pinball machine has 3,500 parts in it. Forgetting all the little chips on the circuit board. I'm proud the circuit board is one, two, you know, uh, but, uh, parts. But there's, you know, yeah, there's 100 of this screw and whatever. There's 3,500 parts in a pinball machine, over half a mile of wire. More man hours than in oh, four days it takes to make a pinball machine. Four man days, 32 labor hours. More man hours than in the four tourists that used to be built near our factory. This is, you know, our first games, our first games, our first two games, uh, this company is 25 years old, started as Data East. We sold it to Sega. I bought it from Sega in 99. Um, our first games were uh, in, in 86, 87. Laser War, Torpedo Alley had two things in common. These games had two things in common. They didn't work. The best pinball people around put them together. They didn't work. We stopped the company for uh, six months, nine months. We redid everything. We put them together. Our MRP system, Material Requirements Planning System, it cost us to get up and running right with that 3,500 parts in a game that we had to control. In those days, we brought in Touche Ross to help us because we couldn't do it ourselves. Big you know, accounting and consulting firm. Cost us over $100,000 in, in $87 wow. so to, to get that system up and running. A fees to them, forget our labor and everything else. It's complex. It is manufacturing. It is real manufacturing. And I'm very proud of the people that, we're doing, that we do this because it's really what this country needs is manufacturing here. We've always manufactured. We export over half of our games. And, you know, we put a little American flag or made in America back on it because we're very proud that we do manufacture things here. So first and foremost, we're manufacturers. You know, the most important thing you do is design games. Now, that's the second most important thing we do. We can design a great game, but if we can't build it or it doesn't work, what was the point of all that? There was no point of it. We have to manufacture things. And the, you know, as I said, Sam started me in the stock room when I was uh, 16. Um, and uh, and just to teach me that that's where you make it or break it. If you don't have enough parts to make the game, then you're wasting labor. You can't build it. You lose money. These are not big margin in these things. Certainly at our, at our pro price, there's barely a margin at all. You know, you, if, you, if you have too much of something, you don't control your labor and your material coming in. What are you going to do with it? It's scrap. You have 10% too much parts, that's 10% off the bottom line that you're not going to make anymore. If you don't make money, you don't continue making pinball machines or anything else. So we are first and foremost, we're, we're a manufacturing company. The design group, what they do most importantly, yes, they design the play field, they come up with these great ideas, so forth and so on. But they make 
and keep up to date the bill of material, the parts list, those things that go into the, all, the listing all the parts. And basically the MRP is just a big exploding adding machine. It's okay, you wanna make 250 of this game, here's the parts list, boom, 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 this is what we need to do, and this is when we should bring it in. All that is programmed into the computer, and it has to be done, and as I say, it, you know, to get it to work, it's a nine, nine to 18 month task and a hundred and some thousand dollars in, in, in old dollars to get it to work. But that's what they do, first and foremost. They design great games, but we can't build them that they can't manufacture. So what I'd like to do is show you something about our manufacturing. Now, um, guys, I make electromechanical demo machines. I'm the first one. Try that one. Let's see if that's it. I think so, yeah.